Yeah, thank you for the invitation for to you, Melissa and uh, Daoud, and the other members of the NCI. Um, today, I'm going to uh, introduce Alex and uh, Giacomo and tell you a little bit about Arches 4 before they uh, go into the details of that. So, Arches 4 is a um, resource that provides uh, all of the RNA seq data that is available from GEO in a uniformed, aligned uh, process. So, all of the data is available for download from this website. This is the landing page of the website. And the resource was published in uh, 2018 in Nature Communication. Alex was the first author of that paper. And all of the data can can be is is served from this website, and this is um, uh, was recently updated, and the pipeline that was used to align the the, the data is a cloud based, a very cost efficient pipeline that Alex developed, and it's uh, it's currently running on AWS using Spot instances. And it's all running in parallel. And then until uh, recently, uh, we have uh, upgraded it to have almost uh, 2 million samples from uh, both human and mouse. So they're divided relatively evenly. And this was aligned against the Ensemble uh, version 107, which corresponds to gen code 41. And we are using the Callisto aligner. Uh, to do this uh, aligner, so it's a pseudo aligner, and the data is available both at the gene count level and the transcript count level. As you can see, the uh, there is a constant growth in um, the samples that are uh, added to uh, GEO, and even though you see a drop in 2023, this is an artificial drop that. Um, uh, you know, it's because it takes some time for the uh, samples to become available. So what we're going to try to convince you today is that Arches 4 is not just serving all of this data, which is already very useful for the community to perform different analysis. It has a whole layer of um, tools and other uh, resources that use the data and demonstrate how to use the data. And in the beginning of the, the talk, Alex will describe more details about Arches 4. He also has a special announcement about a Python package that he just finished developing in this past week. So um, Alex, he's a data scientist and the um, person that is really behind Arches 4, and he has been maintaining it and upgrading it. And uh, Giacomo Marino, he's uh, a recently uh, bioinformatics software engineer that joined our team, and he has developed some uh, new tools that utilize the Arches 4 data for a specific project, including projects that are very relevant for cancer research. So I would like to pass the baton to Alex to uh, uh, begin the presentation. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Arches 4, just to start off, the 4 in the name doesn't really stand for a version, right? So this was uh, when it was conceived, uh, this is the word we came up with. So Arches 4 is a continuously growing uh, database, so we don't really do these large uh, increments. We try to update Arches 4 about uh, at least two times a year, and then eventually, hopefully, we can get it to do like a continuous update in the background. So the the real challenge of of processing all this um, RNA seq data is really to deal with this huge amount of data, right? So it's really in the petabyte scale um, because we, we're talking about millions of fast queue files that have to be moved through a network. So it's uh, really a combination of a networking challenge, and uh, then on the compute level, you really have to be very conscious about the memory usage and uh, you know the compute that you have to put in to align these uh, reads. And then uh, lastly, once you have done all this work, like actually packaging the data and like, getting it into a usable format is like a real challenge. 
And uh, so when we started uh, in 2018, there weren't that many samples um, that were publicly available. There were maybe 200,000 samples. And even then, cost uh, was a real concern because previous efforts, uh, they cited costs of up to a dollar a sample for the compute, which uh, obviously uh, with uh, modern algorithms like Callisto can be really sped up and uh, uh, be done more efficiently. But in the end, it's still a brute force approach where we have to use a large cloud infrastructure that runs hundreds of uh, jobs in parallel. And we basically uh, use as much as AWS gives us, um, you know, in a in a given run. So the last uh, um, uh, update from Arches 4, which is the 2.2 version, we added 500,000 samples, and that's equivalent to about 35,000 compute hours. So if you don't use a lot of parallel processing, you have to wait a long time um, for this to arrive. So then, uh, so this is really, this was the initial problem, right? How do we actually solve this? But then the, the I think, much harder problem that we're working on uh, right now and that a lot of effort goes into is really how to make this data accessible for users and uh, make it useful and seamless. And uh, so this is really challenging because there is different users with different backgrounds and we try to cater uh, to a certain degree to, uh, to these different users. So, you know, we acknowledge that there's people that just want to use interfaces and they're not, you know, necessarily programmers or yeah, willing to like write a whole, you know, program to analyze their data. And then of course there's programmatic users that just want the raw data in a large file and then use machine learning algorithms or whatever they can come up with uh, for their purposes. So we're trying to build tools that address all of these uh, cases. And um, so then another important thing was that we want people to be able to integrate their own data, their private data, into the pre-processed Arches 4 data. So they, they can embed their data into the full spectrum or like the whole of all publicly available RNA-seq data to get a better understanding what they're actually looking at. So for that, uh, we have to make sure that people can replicate the pipeline of Arches 4. And, uh, and then another big factor, this is something that Giacomo will be talking about, is the integration um, of Arches 4 data in other tools. So there will be some examples that we'll uh, discuss today. So just uh, as a really high overview of the architecture, so this was already in the first slide, but um, conceptually, uh, the pipeline is really simple. So uh, we have a Dockerized uh, pipeline, which um, uh, basically downloads the data from the SRA database and uh, then aligns it using Callisto and we just dockerize this. So this is, you know, pretty standard fare nowadays. And uh, when we initially implemented this, we plan to run it as a hybrid cloud. So we had some private servers and uh, we also wanted to use AWS at the same time. So these instances can live technically anywhere and they get their job descriptions or instructions from a uh, scheduler that is uh, running on our servers and uh, that one manages basically jobs if they come out if they fail so we can track uh, all the progress of all these machines at once but they then once they receive an instruction they work autonomously and they do uh, their thing and then when they're done they store the results in uh, an s3 bucket uh, but technically you know this can run on any uh, cloud platform so then uh, as a final result, we get uh, all this RNA-seq uh, data. Um, and the nice thing is that we really compress the data from a petabyte scale to a, let's say, terabyte scale, or like maybe even like in the high gigabyte scale. And uh, so this is much more manageable. And uh, so this, uh, if you go to the website and you go on the visualization button, um, you see these three-dimensional uh, point clouds, and then each point represents a sample that we've processed. And this is just a TSNI visualization of the data. And uh, so here on this website, what you can do is you can search for uh, you know any metadata, and we basically just search that string in the metadata fields um, that were also stored in Geo for that sample. 
And so then you can retrieve uh, samples of interest. So in this example, uh, the user um, typed in MCF7. And uh, so then you can see in the plot, it gets highlighted in yellow. So they cluster nicely together. And so this is something in general that we see that cell lines, uh, because they're very homogeneous, they will cluster together um, very nicely in this in this part cloud. Uh, but we also built some shortcuts for tissues. And then uh, there's another uh, view. You can kind of transpose uh, this data matrix if you want. And you can, instead of having a sample-centric view, uh, look at this data in a gene-centric view. So here it would be a three-dimensional visualization of the genes um, and the space that they occupy in this uh, high-dimensional space. Um, and uh, so then if you go to the next one. Yeah, so then um, because we have all this uh, gene expression, uh, the beauty about it is that it's a uh, whole genome. It's unbiased to prior knowledge. It's really a completely data-driven um, technology. And uh, what this means is it gives us the same amount of information for any gene, whether it's uh, well studied or not studied at all. Uh, and we've previously uh, worked uh, on a great project called Illuminating Druggable Genome that really focused on studying under, like, that look to look at understudied genes. And uh, so what we try to do is, um, and uh, what we do is we make predictions for for genes and and predict annotations that this gene might fit to. Uh, so here's an example of a kinase that's uh, relevant in the cell cycle, and it has been identified as a potential drug target. Um, and uh, so there is not that much known about this gene. There's some annotations, but uh, using the gene expression that we collected from ArcGIS 4 we kind of are able to infer some of the function of these genes uh, just from a data-driven approach. And so this was the very first uh, um, idea to do this. And then if you go to the next one, so, yeah. And uh, so because we have gene expression from basically every possible context, we get a lot of things automatically. So in, in this case, what you see is a um, basically a gene expression atlas that we get for every gene and uh, every conceivable tissue that was ever measured and published in uh, GEO. And uh, so there is actually an interesting effect about this. So if you think of other studies that are very expensive and uh, you know highly cited and very useful, like the GTEx project where they have about 40 different tissues and they have like a very controlled environment where they measure gene expression, um, it's still a very homogeneous data set. And uh, this is slightly more chaotic because uh, each tissue might be measured by many different labs across the world. So there is some variability in this. And I think this is one of the strengths of this data. It's, it's very real in the sense that if you have an experiment and you have gene expression, you will, you know, be slightly different than what GTEx produced, right? And so this uh, kind of reflects this in a sense. But you can really get like a nice idea of how genes are expressed with the variants that you encounter in the real world. Uh, so we assembled uh, a catalog of about 70 tissues. And then at the same time, we also have a catalog of cell lines. And there are also about 70 cell lines uh, in ArcGIS 4 that we map. And you can also see now in the comparison uh, to the uh, tissues, the cell lines have a much more narrow uh, distribution in gene expression because they're just better controlled um, and just more similar in that sense. So uh, the way we initially did this uh, gene annotation prediction is by taking the gene expression matrix. So you can really think of ArcGIS 4 as just a gigantic matrix where the rows are the genes or transcripts and the columns are the samples. So um, in the current release, this would be about 50,000 rows for the genes and a million columns. And from this, uh, we constructed a gene-gene similarity matrix. So the naive approach that we took in the beginning was just to calculate a correlation between genes. 
And uh, that was already pretty good to then infer um, possible annotations for genes just based on similarity to genes that have already been annotated. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is uh, just uh, showing this real brief where we have um, on the left, we have these six different gene set libraries that we got from Enricher. And uh, different libraries, they will be easier or harder to predict. So in this case, the CAC biological, uh, the pathway database from CAC is quite easy to predict. So this means um, how well can we infer known annotations for a given gene? And then we just rank all the pathways, let's say in CAG, from most likely to least likely, and then we can calculate an AOC based on where the known annotations fall. And so the AUCs in general are pretty good. So we get like a pretty good idea already off the gate just with this simple approach. And so all these are accessible on the Artist 4 website. And uh, so this is kind of the uh, front end that we have, and we obviously uh, work hard to improve this uh, capability. Then, uh, so this is uh, going more into like something that would be used by like a more intermediate or expert user. So uh, Arches 4 Pi is this new uh, Python package that Avi was mentioning. So this one, it's a very minimal API. So it allows uh, the search and extraction of gene expression data from the large uh, repository. It allows metadata search. It uh, and that's uh, new. It allows you to align your own fastq files on your computer by just using this package. Um, and then it has some um, convenience functions like normalization and like listing the contents of the H5 files. And then uh, BioJupies has a similar role in the sense that it allows users to access the Arches 4 pipeline. And uh, so this is a very powerful tool that was developed by Dennis Toro, a former lab member. And uh, so this tool allows you to upload fastq files into the cloud and they will go straight into the Arches 4 pipeline and get processed. And then you can do deeper analysis uh, on your gene expression data. So just uh, to quickly show how simple this uh, API is, um, so this is how you could just search, um, like in the first line, this is how you could search for metadata in, in the Arches 4 data. So here I look for myeloid leukemia samples and uh, it will return you a matrix with all the metadata information for those samples. If I want to extract gene counts from samples that uh, have myeloid uh, leukemia in the metadata, I can use that second line. Um, and if I just want to extract all the gene expression from a given geo series, I can do that uh, with uh, the third function. And then uh, uh, the new part is this alignment. And so this is using a very convenient uh, package that we're developing. So in the first line, we can just extract uh, uh, past queue files from the SRA database. It's like a single line. It will like copy it into a folder. And then we can just tell the uh, package to align all the samples in the folder. Uh, and we just have to give it the organism. So in this case, it's just supporting human and mouse. And uh, so the beauty of this is that it also auto like automatically identifies if there's paired reads, like it will just go into the samples and like figure that all out itself. So you don't have to do any uh, configuration. It's just uh, a single line of code. You just give it a folder and you get a matrix of gene expression out of it. Um, and then uh, BioJupies is less programmatic. So this is really something that you can use uh, in the browser. And it's, uh, it's very powerful because uh, not only can you align your RNA-seq data in it, but then you can also do a lot of analysis in it. So this is just an overview of all the functions that it has. But so it has uh, exploratory functions. And then uh, you can also do things like differential gene expression analysis, um, enrichment analysis. You can look for um, potential uh, drugs by looking at the L1000 data. So it's a very uh, comprehensive tool and I really recommend you check it out. So then next, right. So um, now um, I just wanna talk about like how we try to use the Arches 4 data ourselves. 
So I'll start off with this Prism x and Giacomo will uh, continue with uh, uh, tools that he developed. So um, the first thing was that we wanted to see if we can improve this very naive approach that we took to predict gene annotations. And uh, one thing that um, was obvious is that uh, by just computing a single gene-gene similarity matrix from this huge amount of data that we had is quite wasteful and like, it will remove a lot of important information. Uh, specifically, it will remove a lot of tissue-specific uh, patterns. And uh, so there's this interesting effect. It's called the Simpsons paradox. And uh, just by looking at this plot, you kind of see what the issue is here. So in, in this data, if I just look at it as a whole, gene A and gene B are negatively correlated. But uh, if I look at the separate clusters, so let's say I color them by tissue type, uh, the dynamics between the genes are very different. So in, in this case, three of the tissues, the genes are actually positively correlated and uh, in one they're negatively correlated. So there's a lot more um, information in there. So instead of just using uh, correlation of genes, we want to use uh, conditional correlation between genes. And the condition is really, it's conditioned on the tissue type. Um, so if we go to the next slide, right. So this is just a, a simple overview of the algorithm. So in the first step, what we do is just unsupervised clustering, and this should retrieve the tissues or at least, uh, you know, cell types. And uh, you can set the parameter of how many clusters you want to identify in the data. Uh, but we've tested it up to 300 clusters. And then for each of these clusters, you build a separate gene-gene uh, similarity matrix. And then from those, you can build um, a feature space that is then used in a machine learning algorithm to predict uh, whether a gene um, should be annotated with a certain term or not. And so this uh, approach, I'm not going too much into detail, but this approach uh, significantly improves uh, our previous efforts. So uh, the more clusters you have, uh, the better it gets. And uh, you can also imagine that the more RGS4 data there is, the better this will get. So it will scale to a certain degree, but it will certainly uh, flatten off. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so you can use this programmatically. So there is a Python package for that, but then we also uh, built a front end, which is um, accessible on this uh, link below. And it's uh, a quite uh, simple website. So it allows you to input a gene symbol. And uh, if you hit submit, it will return um, about uh, five or six uh, predictions for gene set libraries. And um, it also has the ability, so there, like if you want a different gene set library in Enricher, so Enricher has 220 different libraries. So there's a huge um, amount of uh, diversity there, you can uh, select a different library uh, you want, and then you can go to an Apeta. And an Apeta is basically a, a tool that was developed in the Mayan lab. It allows uh, the execution of Jupyter notebooks uh, with pre-configured uh, information. And uh, so then you can run this in real time in the Apeta framework and get predictions for the gene and a given gene set library. And uh, yeah, so now I think I'm going to pass it on to Giacomo, who has some uh, other interesting applications that use Arches for. Sure. Uh, so this is a site that we developed called LinkHub2, which has annotations about long non-coding RNAs in both human and mice. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we can, uh, so specifically, we have predictions about 18,705 human and 11,274 mouse link RNAs, uh, many of which have very little information known about them. So we predict secondary structure and also show tissue and cell line expression sourced from ARCHIS4. And then we use a gene gene correlation matrix uh, also from ARCHIS4 to predict biological functions, uh, subcellular localization. Uh, gene co-expression networks, uh, as well as L1000 small molecules and CRISPR knockout gene regulators. Um, with the ARCHIS4 data, we can also uh, use it to identify immunotherapeutic targets. So our original motivation uh, for this sort of task was this paper published in Cancer Cell by Boss et al. 
in which they identified GPC2 as an oncoprotein and an immunotherapeutic target in neuroblastoma. Um, they were able to develop an ADC uh, to actually target GPC2 and successfully uh, kill cancer cells. Um, and importantly, the way that they identified GPC2 was looking uh, at its expression compared to the expression uh, across normal uh, healthy tissues from the GTEx atlas. So the plot on the right depicts the expression of GPC2 in neuroblastoma and then in uh, healthy tissues across GTEx. Uh, so this is an ADC or antibody drug conjugate uh, drawn to scale, uh, where we have the antibody that will actually target the cancer cells and then a linker that will join that antibody uh, to a drug, in this case, a cytotoxic drug, uh, to destroy those cells. Uh, so the first ADC was approved by the FDA in 2000, though most of uh, the approved ADCs uh, were um, developed uh, more recently. And in the uh, last uh, few years, there's been uh, sort of a growing interest. So there's um, about 100 in clinical trials now. So the interest in these uh, in this method is, is sort of growing. Um, so, to sort of emulate this approach, we developed uh, the tumor target screener Apiter. So, Apiters, again, as uh, Alex stated, are these uh, interactive Jupyter notebooks running in the cloud uh, in which users can input sort of variable uh, data and, um, and different parameters. Uh, so, if you go to the next, uh, next slide, this is the input form for the, the Apiter in which a user can upload uh, expression at the gene or transcript level. Uh, from a tumor sample and or tumor samples uh, and then choose a normal tissue background to compare it to. So in this case, we have ArcGIS4 selected uh, and then we can also choose to or the user can choose to prioritize membrane genes, uh, normalize uh, their sample to the background distribution uh, as well as show protein expression profiles of the selected candidates. So here we see the uh, normalization on the left of the tumor samples to the background distribution. And for this, we use uh, quantile normalization. And then we also, and then uh, after this, we use Lima to look at the upregulated um, genes in the tumor sample compared to the normal uh, healthy background. Uh, and then in addition, we apply a membrane filter to look at which of these upregulated genes are encode for membrane uh, proteins. Here's an example of sort of the output of the APTR at the end where we get this table of candidates uh, with their significance or uh, with their p-values. Uh, and then you can also uh, look at the expression of these candidates in the uploaded file versus the normal healthy background uh, that you selected in the input form. So we uh, use this method to apply uh, or to identify candidates in the 1,000 about 1,000 tumor samples collected in the CPTAC program, which includes uh, transcriptomic, transcriptomics, phosphoproteomics, and proteomics data, data from uh, 10 cancer subtypes. So uh, in our methods here, we uh, clustered based each uh, cancer subtype separately uh, into groups of patients that shared similar expression vectors. And then as I uh, stated before, we did some quantile normalization and identified upregulated membrane proteins and then finally form these target heat maps in which we show uh, which targets were identified uh, compared to the ArcGIS4 and GTEx backgrounds. So these are some of the results for five of the cancer subtypes. And we can see that um, this yellow indicates that there was, this target was identified um, when compared to the ArcGIS4 and GTEx background. So one thing to note is that we see sort of nice concordance between the ArcGIS4 and GTEx um, backgrounds acting as that healthy tissue uh, compared to the tumor sample. And we also apply uh, this, we look at the proteomic expression as well, since the CPTAC uh, program collected that, and that's what these uh, stars indicate. So we see that there's also um, significant upregulation, uh, which is the double star, uh, whereas just norm, whereas just upregulation is the single star here. Um, another thing to note is that we see targets that apply across a whole cancer subtype, and these are the ones sort of appearing at the top of the uh, heat map, as well as targets that are more specific to a certain uh, cluster or grouping of patients. Um, and then these are the res results for the second five uh, subtypes from the CBDAC consortium in which we see sort of similar uh, results. 
Uh, so there's a few sort of limitations and few directions to this approach. So the one, one is that this is done at the mRNA level as opposed to the protein level, uh, and these results need to be experimentally validated. Uh, additionally, some targets may be identified across many different cancer types and may not be specific to a certain subtype. Uh, additionally, the delivery of ADCs and CAR-T uh, therapies is not a trivial process. Uh, and then one other thing to note is that this approach can be applied at the individual uh, patient level. So in order to make this, uh, this pipeline and these processes uh, available and easy to use, we developed two uh, websites that host process ARCHIS4 data. Um, so the first is GeneRanger, which shows the expression of a single uh, gene across transcriptomic and proteomic atlases, including ARCHIS4, GTEx, Tavia Sapiens, CCLE, HPA, and HPM. And then we also have Target Ranger, uh, which utilizes those process uh, atlases to uh, aid in target identification to find those genes that are highly expressed in the input and lowly expressed across normal uh, cells and tissues. Uh, so this is the uh, Gene Ranger page showing expression of STAT3 from the ARCHIS4 uh, resource. And we're just looking at a small portion of the ARCHIS4 uh, tissues here in which there's about 150 included on the site. Um, uh, the atlases can be easily switched uh, on the top of the screen or on the left panel. And there's additionally a button to look at the transcripts exp expression for the gene that you're looking at. So if you're the next page, we can, we can also utilize the uh, transcript count matrix uh, provided by ARCHIS4 as well as GTEx uh, to, to display uh, transcript expression statistics as well. This is the input form for Target Ranger, which looks somewhat similar to the Apiter, where a user can upload an RNA-seq profile from cells they wish to target and remove, uh, select whether their um, uploaded file is at the gene or transcript level, and then select their healthy tissue background, in this case, ARCHIS4 is selected, and also choose whether to prioritize membrane or secreted genes. So here's an example of the results provided by Target Ranger. We're provided a table where we can look at um, the test statistic as well as uh, significance values and log fold change, and uh, the membrane and secreted filters can also be applied on this table after submitting the file. Below the table, we can uh, select or search for a specific target that was identified and look at, ex at its expression in the input file compared uh, to the healthy atlas that was used or any of the other uh, atlases that are contained within Target Ranger. Uh, we also systematically applied Target Ranger to all the TCGA uh, subtypes, uh, employing a similar approach uh, to the CPTAC uh, pipeline that I showed before in which we clustered each subtype by expression vectors uh, and submitted them, comparing them to uh, ARCHIS4, GTEx, and Tabio sapiens to produce these target heat maps, which you can see at the bottom. Uh, additionally, we have a table that shows sort of the amount of samples in each of these clusters, common mutations throughout the cluster, uh, as well as a link to download, as well as submit uh, directly uh, to Target Ranger. So just an overview of some of these tools, we have LinkUp2, which has this predicted and aggregated knowledge about um, 18,000 human and 11,000 mouse link RNAs, which utilizes this ARCHIS4 gene gene correlation matrix. We have the tumor target screener Apiter, which uh, is a tool to identify immunotherapeutic targets in an uploaded RNA-seq expression uh, file using ARCHIS4 as a healthy background atlas. And this we applied to the CBTAC cohort. And then, we also have Gene Ranger and Target Ranger, which are user friendly web portals that utilize ARCHIS4 expression uh, as a healthy expression atlas, uh, as well as other process transcriptomic and proteomic atlases. Um, so, users may examine an expression of a single gene across atlases on Gene Ranger and then utilize those background atlases to identify immunotherapeutic targets uh, on Target Ranger. All right, so I guess I can summarize and uh, first would like to thank uh, Alex and Giacomo for their excellent uh, presentations. I also want to mention that there were some other people in the lab that were involved. Uh, Daniel Clark was the, the original person that developed the Apiter that Giacomo uh, showed. And we also had a, a lot of help from Eden Deng that developed those heat maps uh, approach for uh, and the 
final the tool that you showed. And uh, we are hosting every year uh, uh, over 10 summer undergrads that joined the lab. Eden was one of them. Also, Daniel was a prior member of that program. And uh, I would really like to thank the ITCR program for uh, their support of the Arches 4 uh, resource. And uh, that's about it for us from today. And we can now take some questions if uh, 